standing in front of the statue of my great-grandfather, who was a small man who started life with so very little. It's the sheer ambition of Wellin. He grew up above the shop in East London with so little, and yet he could create something so big. And it wasn't at a time when you could conjure money up from the state or anything. He just had to find it somehow or other. And he bought the land at auction without having a penny of it. And what he created here is a place that truly reflects his internationalist spirit. He was an internationalist. In 1898, Ebenezer Howard published Tomorrow, A Peaceful Path to Real Reform. Howard's book set out, clearly, the case for planning for a better future. In 1903, this led to the establishment of Letchworth, the world's first garden city. The Letchworth project attracted to it many people who would be key figures in the future of garden city development. By the end of the First World War, they were looking for suitable land on which to build a second garden city. Ebenezer Howard was living in Letchworth, commuting to London, and he passed through this area on the train and thought it was the ideal spot. Then it came up for sale, and Howard acted alone, away from his townsmen, and that younger generation were beginning to think that the state would take on the idea of building garden cities, but Howard was determined that Letchworth should not be the only one and that ultimately London should be ringed by garden cities. Came to the auction, ended up borrowing 50 quid off the auctioneer. So this sort of quiet, shy man had just got out and created the town. Howard's initiative secured the land but his own moral philosophy was very far from individualism. He was much more of a cooperator, mutualist, associationist, really working with other people together, never top down, always bottom up. He was also hugely influenced by his wife, Eliza Ann Lizzie. There was a beautiful article written by Lord Grey about how she was the better orator. She was better at raising money. She knew how to work a room and convince people of the cause, and she was indefatigable in that. A young Canadian architect, Louis de Soissons, was engaged as master planner. The design of the second garden city was very different to that of the first. Whereas Letchworth had been a quintessential design in the arts and crafts style by Parker and Unwin, here, the design is much more classical in the Beaux-Arts style established first in France and really developed in the United States and Canada. De Soissons had studied in Paris and certainly he'd picked up this sort of French planning tradition that everything evolves out of the plan, that you had long formal grand allées and boulevards he extended that into the design of buildings themselves and he adopted this away neo-Georgian style for his work. It was to these newly laid out streets that Frederick Osborne brought his family to live while the project was still in its infancy. He had been a rent collector recruited from London to work at Letchworth Garden City for Ebenezer Howard and he then became captivated by the whole Garden City idea. They moved here as soon as they could and they moved first of all to Broxwood Lane here in the Welling Gardens. It's one of the first housing uh, streets built. And then this one, they moved here when it was brand new in 1925 and he was still living here when he died. And it was from this place that he led his campaigns uh, nationally and internationally for the Newtowns movement. And it was from here that his wife Margaret um, took a very full part with him on that campaign and in the life of this growing garden city. When this project started here at Welling Garden City, it was a private sector 
project with limited dividend returns, so investors never got more than 5%. That was the deal. Howard thought that there'd be enough philanthropic people to fund a great project like this, and they'd be happy with 5%. It took a long while to get the town established. The 1920s depression it slowed down development after the First World War. The Addison Housing Act that had promised so much, state involvement really collapsed. Howard's conviction that they must not wait for the state to act had proved prescient. But the Welland experiment was as much about building community as about building houses. The mechanics of the physicality of it is one set of concerns for the technocrats. But the building of community and its creative and artistic life and its culture and its religiosity and its artistic community, all that lot, is part of what these people were attracted by and committed a significant part of their life to. So they weren't just numbers catching a train to commute. They had come here to be part of a new community a community of strangers from which they wrought the most extraordinary amount of endeavour and creative activity. Given Ebenezer Howard's commitment to peaceful progress, it's an ironic twist that it was the rearmament programme of the 1930s which finally provided the economic boost that Wellin needed. But even as the war was being fought, the Garden City movement was planning for the peace. Planning for post-war England did happen while the bombs were dropping. It's very hard for our generation to imagine how that can have happened. It's like as if they had to imagine, supposing we win, then what happens? At the end of the Second World War, the new Labour government, the first with a big majority, looked to establish new towns and, and really take on uh, um, Howard's ideals for the Garden City adapted to the way a state system would work rather than the private company. And Second Garden City Limited was well prepared to be part of that process. In fact, they'd acquired additional land with the intention of expanding the Garden City itself. But Lewis Silkin felt that it wasn't suitable for a private enterprise, a private company, to build a new town because they couldn't be sure that the needs of the community would be served, which is interesting in itself when in the 1930s, following the economic depression, the directors of Second Garden City Limited actually changed the memon arts of the organisation to remove the element which required the profits to be reinvested for the benefit of the community. A complete contradiction on Howard's model, something luckily, in a way, he was not around to see. The shift to Newtown status brought with it the state's greater ability to finance delivery and facilitate strategic planning. The continuing presence of such figures as Osborne and de Soissons ensured a vital connection to the original vision. But there were, inevitably, compromises on Howard's original Garden City principles, and one compromise, at least, was to have a fundamental impact on the future of Wellin and the new towns. Howard had always intended that the land assets uh, and the local economy were mutualised in the Garden City for the benefit of Garden City inhabitants. And in Wellen, one of the consequences of it being designated as a new town was that those assets became owned by the state. So when the Thatcher government forced the premature wind-up of all of the new town development corporations, Wellen's assets, like the others, were sold off to the private sector and in agreements to the local authority, which meant essentially that the local economy became like any other town. Ownership for me is everything, and it's, it's, it's um, encapsulated in the... TCPA's 10 Garden City Principles and it's routinely ignored. The Garden City model is a social model and an economic model. Land value capture, community governance and long-term stewardship are essential principles of Garden Cities. Today that has meant that it's a real challenge for the council, those responsible for Welland, to look after the fantastic Garden City assets. It's a really interesting contrast with Letchworth Garden City, which, although it's had its own challenges, was able to retain some element of reinvesting the profits of the development uh, back into the community to provide additionality for all those fantastic facilities in the Garden City. Whereas Wellen has all of these assets to look after, but without the resources to do so. The eventual abolition of the Newtown Development Corporations left a vacuum in the planning of new communities. 
The current dismantling of the planning system itself has made it harder still for Wellen to respond to development pressures in a way that's consistent with its founding principles. Part of the maturing of a town uh, would be to expect the patterns of industry and home to break where uh, design and operational considerations allow. So laying out new places, you would expect to see more small office suites, shops, home working units, um, of that kind of thing in and amongst and above the neighbourhood shopping centre or the district shopping centre. The way this would have been handled if it was still a new town development corporation not yet abolished is that the development corporation would have been hands-on designing with the town the way to move itself, modernise its pattern of activities into the 21st, 22nd century. Welling still offers a living example of how Garden City principles can solve current problems. I think the Garden City model provides an ideal solution to say how people can live with nature in harmony and how communities we can support each other in a freedom and a cooperative way. We can see all the state of art sustainable development principles embedded in Garden City principles. For example, like nature-based solutions, 15 minutes workable neighborhood, local job, locally produced food, community support and social inclusion. It's a town of about 50,000 now, so it's big enough to host a wide range of services, you know, good shops, a theatre, a cinema. During lockdown, I think everybody here has appreciated having gardens that they can just sit out in or walk around. Everybody's appreciated being able to walk into the countryside. All of those aspects which count towards well-being. And Howard was thinking about this over a hundred years ago. We've still got lots of challenges ahead with climate change and these really big issues. What we have here is a place which started off with some principles which are as sound today as they were then. I mean, they've proved resilient. Perhaps one of the things that we should be thinking about is, is how Welling Garden in its next century can be an exemplar for you know, developing some of these ideas which we're going to have to come up with if we're going to live this good life in a decent place. Welling Garden City is 120 with trees, flowers and grass aplenty. To build a unique town was Ebenezer Howard's mission and we who live here are glad his plans have come to fruition. Stanborough Lakes holds many memories of the times I spent with friends and family. My granddad eating a Miss Twippy at the cafe was his favourite treat at the end of the day. There's a tree at every step you take and just about all the different types of flowers you can imagine. A sea of colour, a rainbow city. Every time I pass a fountain, it makes me smile, no matter the mood I'm in. Our city feels very green and open and full of places to explore. I can also walk to school, which is good for the environment. I especially enjoyed going to coffee shops with my friends and family and also browsing in local shops in the evening. I could easily walk into town and grab a bite to eat. We have a lovely town centre with our history still intact. Our town is now 100 years old, but it has grown and we have too. If he's still true to his character, which I believe he would be, he would be campaigning, speaking about, trying to create a movement for real deep social change in a peaceful fashion. And he would know that he faced an uphill battle, but he would still be trying. He would see the task to be done. He would know the size of it and he would get on with it.